Hello, and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. My name is Caleb Denby, uh, and today I'm going to be walking you through uh, one of the last lines of the Karakhan that I have not yet covered. Uh, so it is going to be the fantasy variation today. Uh, the fantasy variation, uh, a name with a very fun name, or well, an opening line with a very fun name, uh, and it does look rather threatening at first glance from the white pieces. Uh, so it's definitely one worth taking a look at here. It is not the most popular response to the Karakhan, but it is uh, one of the main lines, I would consider it. So why don't we just take a look here. I've got a game between Mikhailo uh, Oleksienko and Sam Shankland. Of course, Sam, former US champion now, uh, with the black pieces. Of course, the game starts with e4, c6, d4, d5. And now, uh, so far, we've covered a variety of moves here from white. The three big ones are knight c3 or knight d2. We'll kind of uh, boat those in together. Uh, e5 or e takes d5. These are the three main responses by white. And f3 is the fantasy variation, and it is the most often kind of overlooked line, I would say, from uh, the Carol repertoire here of the main uh, third moves that, that white can reply with. And now there are a variety of ways of playing. The way I'm going to recommend is kind of most in line with the, the classic Karo philosophy, being that you want to develop this bishop outside of the pawn chain uh, before playing the move e6. That being said, the most common move here is in fact e6, uh, going for a more kind of triangle defense setup. And this is a very, very solid way of playing. It's not a bad way of playing at all. Um, because it's forced white to go into a slightly weird line against uh, something like the triangle. And uh, so if you want to play lines like this, you're more than welcome to. But the way I'm going to recommend is with d takes e4 and f takes e4. Uh, and now at first glance, it looks like you give up a, a pretty strong uh, center here to your opponent with the white pieces. The advantage to this, though, is that white has sort of overextended in the center already. And so because of that, black can also make a very strong claim in the center immediately. Uh, because white has spent so many tempi getting these two pawns out, black wastes no time and immediately plays the move e5. And this is going to be the, the crux of the fantasy, fantasy variation line that I'm recommending for black. It's going to be this pawn right here on the e5 square. Uh, a slightly outdated term uh, in chess principles, chess strategy, one that you may not have heard, is the term of the strong point defense. And that term kind of applies to this line in the Karo Khan. So we're going to see a variety of games, but they really all revolve around, around this e5 square. When your opponent has uh, these strong central pawns like this, uh, the most common way that players lose games is they play a slightly worse move. Let's say move like e6. And then later on in the game, uh, just for example, uh, both players develop their pieces a little bit. Knight d7, bishop d3, knight f6. Later on in the game, the uh, enemy ends up pushing uh, something like e5 or d5 to open up just a ton of lines, take a ton of central space, and kind of roll over the opponent here. And the idea with e5 in this opening line is you don't allow this e5 move from white to ever happen. And if white never gets this e5 move in, well then the, the open lines are not going to ever open, and this central majority isn't actually going to be worth all that much. Uh, white doesn't find a good way to use it. So this is the strong point defense that black is using here with e5. So e5, knight f3. Uh, now bishop g4, of course, is the, the classic Karo way to play. Now bishop c4 is the most common way to play by white. And really, white goes for more or less a, a very similar setup in, in almost every line. There is one very interesting line with the move bishop d3 that we're going to take, take a look at a little bit later. Uh, but this, uh, obviously, not, not bishop d3 here. Rather, first c3, I think, and then bishop d3 to make sure that d4 stays protected. But uh, for the moment, we're going to look at bishop c4 first. Now here, uh, it is very important that you play knight d7. Who in the chat uh, can find a tactic for white after the move knight f6? Perhaps the most natural move here. Who in the chat can find a tactic? Who sees the tactic? 
So yes, uh, as Ite Sitbon has said, the tactic begins with bishop takes f7. Now after king takes f7, there's this move, knight takes c5. When unfortunately for black, this bishop is defended once, uh, but being defended once is not going to be enough here. So knight takes c5 and bishop takes f7. That's why knight d7 is the only move for black. Now if the same tactic is tried, well, we have this e5 square covered. So of course if knight takes c5, knight takes c5 covers the bishop. And if knight g5, well, simply queen takes g5 uh, is a winning desperado for black. Of course, black at the end of the day is going to end up up a piece uh, compared to white. So knight d7, uh, the move here. Have to be on the lookout. Do not play knight f6. You will lose horribly. Uh, knight d7 first. Always remember. Okay. Kingside castles for black. And now knight gf6. Uh, sorry, kingside castles for white. Knight gf6 for black. And now the move c3 is likely going to come on the board. Uh, and we'll talk about some move order tricks by white uh, in the next game. But for the moment, uh, with this move order by white, the most common move order, you can just play the move bishop d6 here. Like I said, it's the strong point defense. So we're not really going to play a move like bishop e7 in most of these lines because we want to hold our strong point on e5. It's all about defending this e5 pawn. Uh, so bishop e7, probably not going to be good enough here for black, not defending the square enough times. So bishop d6. Now bishop g5 is a very common way to play by white. This is more or less the main plan for white. Uh, white goes bishop g5, and then we'll see later, wants to increase the pressure on this king's side uh, at, a, at a later date. Black uh, can simply castle. Now knight bd2 is a natural developing move. And uh, the kind of weird move, queen c7 by black. Uh, so once again, uh, I can't stress this enough, it's all about controlling the e5 square in this line for black. Um, just an example of some travesties that might happen. If you play a move like bishop e7, let's say a move like bishop e3, castles, knight bd2, uh, black or white can just play very simply. Let's say a move like a5 comes on the board. Uh, well, all of a sudden, uh, let's see. Uh, eventually, let's say queen e1. Um, and okay, let's just say black wastes the tempo, for example. If, if you ever lose this e5 pawn, if you ever allow white to kind of crash through on this square, then it's, it's going to just be game over. Uh, that's, that's the point I'm trying to get across. So that's why we're using all of our pieces to defend e5. Sorry, I didn't give the best counter example there, but just trust me. It's all about e5 here. All about e5. Now, queen e1 from white is the main way to play. You just simply want to get this queen out to h4. Uh, and now Sam in this game shows a pretty interesting way to reorganize the pieces here. White has now, of course, broken the pin on this knight. And so black has uh, a couple options for what he wants to do. He can try and leave this bishop on g4. But it's going to be a little bit shaky on this square due to threats from the queen. So in the game, uh, Sam simply chose the move bishop h5, trying to reroute this bishop all the way back to g6. Now, there are a couple different ways you can play here. A couple different things have been tried. Uh, the move b5 comes to mind. We'll see b5 occur later in this game. The move h6 is actually also playable. And this is a pretty interesting way of dealing with these sort of problems on the king side, because it forces white to make a decision of bishop h4 or bishop e3. Now, with bishop h4, I think that black is, is actually going to be quite happy with the way that things have gone, uh, because you no longer have to worry about this threat of queen h4, putting more pressure on this knight. Uh, but I think bishop e3 does actually give black uh, a little bit more to worry about, because you're always going to have to be on the lookout for this move, queen h4. And any kind of sacrifice here on h6 is actually going to be uh, well worth considering for white. Uh, so I don't really like this move h6. It just gives the opponent uh, a few too many sacrificing chances on the king side, I think. Uh, it's just a bit too weakening, giving your opponent this, this hook, as I like to say. Uh, so bishop h5 uh, seems normal. Now queen h4 was played in this game, adding more pressure to this knight on f6. And now simply bishop g6. This is the reroute that uh, Sam has completed now. Uh, in the game, uh, Oleksienko played the slightly strange looking move, king h1, uh, and who in the chat knows why king h1 was played, or has some idea as to why king h1 was Oleksienko's choice here. 
Uh, how does it make any sense? Why is the strong point defense considered outdated? Um, sorry, I, I kind of misspoke. It's not an outdated way of playing. It's just you don't hear this term too often anymore. Um, the only place I've really seen it is like books written in, in the 80s. Uh, for some reason, it, it, this kind of term has just kind of been lost, I think. Uh, I have heard some players use it, but uh, so the term itself, I think, is what's outdated, not, not the strategy. You'll, you'll see quite often, actually, specifically in like Roy Lopez positions, this E4, E5. Uh, structure is, is black's main way of playing, and, and white still gets this d4 in, but black creates this kind of strong point on e5 to, to slow down the, the play. <clears throat> so we can move the d pawn, uh, and to prevent queen b6. So you guys pretty much, uh, pretty much have it here. Knight g1 is, is not really going to be the idea. Uh, white doesn't really want to spend all this time retreating this knight. It's true that it does add attackers to f6, but we'll see white has a better way of doing that uh, as he played in the game. So it is very much just to prevent these lines with queen b6, and more specifically, to prevent queen b6 after this d-pawn moves out of the way. Uh, so again, if this d-pawn ends up moving, then queen b6 is going to come on the board with, with pretty good effect. So, uh, in the game, rook a e8 was Sam Shanklin's choice. He's trying to spy this e4 pawn, uh, kind of an x-ray attack through this pawn. Now, black is going to be the one threatening to uh, take on d4. Of course, it gives up our strong point a little bit, but it's well worth it if we take away our opponent's central majority. We, we don't really need the, the strong point if we kill the center, right? So rook a e 8 rook a e 1 was the natural follow-up by Oleksienko, simply supporting this pawn further. Uh, and now we do see the move b5 from Sam Shankland, just gaining a little bit of queenside space, bishop b3. And now this is the position where uh, I had to stop and analyze for quite a bit. I think this is more or less the, the critical position for this fantasy variation line for uh, both sides here. This is really the most natural way of playing for white and the most natural way of playing for black. You could argue that the move king h1 was a little bit slow, but uh, we're going to take a look at, at what happens if d takes e5 occurs immediately, uh, and uh, a lot of those lines end up uh, failing to things like queen b6 check. So in my opinion, king h1 is a, a perfectly fine move by, by white. So now it's kind of decision time for black. We've kind of been delaying making a decision about what to do by making kind of threats that improve our pieces. So for example, rook a8 created a threat to e4, b5 created a threat to the bishop, um, and before that we had threats of queen b6 uh, winning b2. But now white has sort of dealt with, with all of those threats, and we can't really make any more immediate threats. So what's going to happen if we just play a normal looking move? For example, if the move a6 comes on the board, a, a perfectly fine strengthening move on the queen side supporting the b5 pawn. What is white going to do? Um, I, I'll let you at home uh, try and come up with an answer, but I'm not going to wait too long on this one. Uh, yes, hello to Tarqueen Clark. Of course, I do remember you from some previous lectures. Uh, but OK, what white is going to do is take on e5. This is kind of the crux of white's play. Black has built up this strong point on e5. Uh, and white has been trying to break it down. Uh, and it hasn't really seemed like that's what white has been doing. But the way white went about doing this is by attacking this f6 knight. So by attacking this f6 knight, we're overworking now this knight on d7 and forcing black to make some concessions to keep this e5 pawn. So now, for example, this has actually been played in a couple games in the Lee Chess database, not by super high level players. Uh, and they all played knight takes e5, allowing this bishop takes f6, g takes f6. Uh, and now, actually, in both of these games, black ended up winning. But I think after the move knight d4, uh, black actually does have quite a few problems here to, uh, to try and solve. So I don't like this way of, of playing, just slowly, because I do think that uh, this is a legitimate threat from, from white. Now, of course, black could take this back with the bishop instead. But uh, while I do think this is OK for black, I'm always hesitant to uh, give up the bishop pair like this. Uh, with the bishop pair off the board, uh, 
I do think white actually does have uh, a little bit of something to play for. For example, knight f3, queen c5, and already e5. And, and these lines that we weren't so happy about uh, being opened are, are starting to, to kind of come apart. Now, knight d5 could come on the board, and I really do think this is a perfectly playable position for black. I just think it might be a little bit more comfortable for white. Not saying white has a huge advantage here, but white does have this central space, and with the bishop pair, black is going to have to be very careful, or else he could fall into a significantly worse position. So, all of that is to say, our opponent really has made a threat here with d takes e5. Uh, and so there's a couple different ways you can meet this threat. There's the way that Sam Shanklin played, and then there's the way that I'm actually going to recommend. Uh, so Sam played the move knight h5. And this is another one of those lines that uh, is going to get into a, a playable position for black. It just gets a little bit complex along the way. So if you're perfectly fine with that, I think knight h5 is a, a totally fine move that Sam Shanklin came up with in this game. The other move that I'm going to recommend is actually the move c5 here. And this move c5 is a pretty natural break for black in these positions. Um, in my practical games, I actually rarely get to this type of uh, position because, in my experience, the, the white players kind of don't always uh, fully know what, what they're doing, if I'm 100% honest with you. They, they play some strange stuff. Uh, so it's good to remember this c5 break. This is a good freeing move for black. Now, if white plays the move d5, we're actually quite happy about this with the black pieces. We're going to break through a c4 now. This bishop has to get out of the way. And then the space on the queen side is going to be very good for black. And in the meantime, white's pawns are kind of permanently locked down in the center here. This d pawn is technically a, a protected passed pawn, but it's not going to be an entirely useful for, uh, excuse me, for white. And then Sam Shanklin's move, knight h5, would be a, a perfectly fine follow-up uh, to this line. So I like this move, c5. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about those lines now, I guess. Yeah, we'll, we'll stick with these lines and get back to the game. Uh, the critical line, of course, is still d takes e5. This is the line that uh, is critical. So what's different here from the line that I showed with a6? Well, here after knight takes c5, I do think this is the best way of playing. Uh, bishop takes f6, g takes f6. Uh, note that queen takes f6 might be a little bit premature because moves like knight d3 are going to come on the board. Moves like c4 can also come on the board. Moves like knight takes f3, uh, when this pawn is a little bit awkward to defend, uh, might also come on the board. Uh, just for example, knight takes f3. Uh, g takes f3 is the only way to keep this pawn. And then a move like bishop e7 is already highlighting that this queen is a little bit stuck over here. It has to come all the way to a6. There's actually no other safe square for this queen. Uh, and then moves like c4, bishop c2, and even like queen f4, or actually I guess this pawn's hanging, so like rook b8. And the fact is this queen is just totally out of play over here on a6. So queen takes f6, a little bit of a mistake. Instead though, you would probably see uh, g takes f6, and then some other move here for white. Uh, and the point of my play is basically I'm getting the c4 move in, and after c4, the d3 square is always going to be a nice target for me, uh, and I'm going to have some play on, on the queen's side here. Uh, you do get this uncomfortable pawn structure uh, with f6 and uh, h7, or sorry, f6 and f7, and h7, of course, but you get play on the e pawn, you get play on the queen's side, and I think this is a perfectly fine way of playing for black. Now, uh, if you don't like the look of those lines, then probably the way that Sam played is your best bet. Knight h5 doesn't allow this bishop takes f6, g takes f6 business. Um, okay, so knight h5 played in the game. d takes e5 is still really the only try for white. Note that we would always meet the move d5 with c5. Uh, well, I guess not always. Uh, sometimes you can actually take this pawn. But c5 and c4 is, is a pretty nice structure for black, as I previously stated. So knight h5 uh, takes e5, knight takes e5, knight takes e5, bishop takes e5, and now knight f3 from black. Uh, sorry, from white. And I do think now that this position from Sam is the simplest way uh, for black to play, and probably it's just going to be the, the easiest equality that, that you're going to find. Uh, the downside to the way that Sam played is either one, 
Here you have to play the move bishop f6 in order to keep your, your bishop pair or trade off your bishop for white's bishop rather than the knight. And in doing so, you do give up control of this e5 square. Or your other option is just to continue play on the queen side with a move like a5. Uh, so you get play on the queen side, but in return, uh, white does get your bishop pair here on e5. And I actually do like this way of playing uh, a little bit better. For example, a5, knight takes e5. Uh, either queen or rook takes is perfectly fine. And now white might reroute this bishop, hitting this knight on h5. And you might uh, see the move h6 come on the board to avoid uh, dying. <laughs> uh, okay, so h6, bishop c1, and now rook fe8. And the point for black here, I think this is a really comfortable position for black, uh, is you just have this really extraordinarily weak pawn on e4. Uh, and white has two bishops, but not a lot to do with them. Uh, basically, white's pieces are just going to be tied down to defending this pawn, and black, I think, is, is actually just uh, a slight bit better. A slight bit better. It's hard to really like the black pieces with the, this bishop pair. Even if black wins this pawn on e4, the bishops are going to be a uh, force to be reckoned with, but uh, a pawn is a pawn, and black has a really nice target uh, in this line. Now, Sam didn't like something about this, so he played uh, perhaps an even simpler way with bishop f6, just trading off white's dark squared bishop and going for more or less total equality. Uh, in the game, bishop takes f6 was played, knight takes f6, and as I said now, the downside is white does get to play this move e5 with this extra central uh, space here, uh, and that's how white is going to claim to, uh, to have anything to, to really play for. Now, knight d5 was played in the game, and uh, the move queen d4 was actually white's choice. There are a variety of moves here that white can try. Even c4 is worth considering, trying to break up these black pawns. Uh, the move queen g3 is perfectly fine, just taking a slower approach, defending this pawn, opening up h4 for the knight. Moves like knight d4 could also come on the board with a little bit of pressure on these squares. But uh, queen d4 played in the game. And now black actually has a really interesting way here to uh, immediately uh, equalize and perhaps even uh, claim a, a slight advantage. So I'll let you guys at home to try and find black's next move. It's a really fun move, actually. Uh, I'll be impressed if you guys can uh, find it. Because um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty crazy move. It's understandable why, why Sam didn't see it in the game. Uh, I think if he did see it, he probably would have played it, uh, because it is actually just, I think, a good move but wasn't played in the game. So see if you can find what Sam Shankland could not. Um, and yeah, the, the problem with g4, I think, in any position for white is that this f4 square just ends up being a little bit too weak. You kind of need this pawn back here to uh, guard the square then this diagonal isn't actually always going to stay closed for forever and ever. Thought Sam was a super GM? Uh, yeah, he kind of is. This game is a little bit old. It's from 2013. So uh, perhaps he just hadn't reached his prime yet. Perhaps as a super GM, he would have found the move. Ah, so Toblerone actually has the answer here, uh, as does Tarek. Uh, Nate says rook d8. Congratulations, Nate. You're playing like Sam Shankland, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, and rook d8 might actually be a perfectly... Uh, it, it's also a perfectly fine move here for black. Black is just doing fine. But the move c5 is really fun. The point being, if queen takes d5, well, now rook d8, and this queen actually has no squares. Actually just has zero squares. That is a trapped queen. Uh, so the move queen d2 would likely have to be played, and then uh, a simple move like knight b6 is, is going for this move c4 to follow. And probably this is some kind of equality here, just some kind of equality. White might break through with e6, but then c4, you can expect takes, and takes with one of these pieces, let's say, well, let's say bishop, it seems more natural. Bishop c2, bishop d5, and white has a little bit of pressure over here, Black has a little bit of extra space over here, but at the end of the day, all the rooks are going to come off on these open files, and uh, it's, it's just going to be uh, going to be equality. Uh, in the game, though, rook d8 was played, queen c5 by white, and now queen b6 was uh, Sam's reply. Queen takes b6, a takes b6, 
And now with queens off the board, uh, white still tries to prove a little something with this knight here. But now c5 is Sam's response to knight d4. And if knight takes b5 came on the board, well, there's a slightly uncomfortable fork here. And this is actually playable for white due to the move c4. But once again, not going to be anything more than equality here. Um, so instead, though, knight c6 comes on the board. And Sam finds the nice move here, c4, to uh, stay in the game. If he didn't have c4, I think Sam is honestly just losing, because there's no way to stop this annoying threat by white. So the move c4 by Sam Shankland. Now knight takes d8 comes on the board, and c takes b3. Uh, and fortunately for, uh, uh, for black here, if white tries to save this knight, well, now b takes a2 is going to be really, really strong. Rook a1, bishop b1, and this is not really the end game that, uh, that white is hoping for, uh, to be 100% honest. So, instead of knight c6, uh, a takes b3 was played, rook takes d8, and now Sam actually ends up in a slightly worse uh, pawn down end game, uh, where he has uh, a knight and a bishop for, for the pawn. And the rooks are, are going to be pretty good here. Uh, we see rook d1, bishop c2, c4 is white's choice, and Sam simply gives back the pieces and gets into this pawn down endgame, which he held with ease, being the strong grandmaster that he is. He simply gets active with this rook, makes some threats on this side of the board, and starts pushing uh, his own pawns over here. And this is a, a very fun endgame. But uh, fortunately for you guys, it's not an end games class, it is an openings class, so we'll just play through these moves pretty quickly here. And here the players just agreed to a draw with the Black King being a superstar blockading these two white pawns. Uh, so this was a pretty interesting game uh, by these two players. I think this was more or less the, the critical line to, to look at here uh, in this opening variation. Just to recap slightly before moving on, of course, we're looking at the fantasy variation. Uh, if you want perhaps the most solid way of playing, the move e6 is very, very comfortable for black, but it's not really in the style of the caro. So if you want to play like a caro player, take c4, take c4, e5 now, knight f3, and we get this bishop out to g4. These moves are all more or less forced. Bishop c4, knight d7, castles, knight gf6, c3, bishop d6, once again. Strong point defense here on the d6 square. Bishop g5, black castles, knight bd2, queen c7. Really going after this square. Uh, and now I'm going to claim, really, the only real try for uh, white here is to go queen e1 and queen h4, as we saw in the game. Just a brief mention, if moves like queen c2 start coming on the board, that's really when uh, things like this c5 break start to be uh, considerable for, uh, for black. For example, the move b5 could come on the board, bishop d3, a6, h3, for example, takes, takes, and now even the move c5. And it's these kinds of breaks that uh, find a quality for, uh, for black here. So always keep in mind the c5 break if your opponent isn't putting on the utmost pressure uh, on you as Mihail Michaelo did in this game. I cannot say that name. I apologize. So queen e1 puts the most pressure on black and doesn't really allow black time for these c5 breaks in a lot of the cases. So bishop h5, queen h4, bishop g6 is the big reroute for Sam. Now after king h1, rook e8, rook a e1, b5, bishop b3. This is where Sam chose to play this nice move, knight h5, which uh, I like the move c5 pretty much just as much, but knight h5 is perhaps a little bit simpler equality for black. The move d takes e5 came on the board, knight takes e5, takes, takes, knight f3. Uh, and then here is really where I think Sam might have given his opponent a bit too much. I like the move a5 uh, with the point that after takes and takes, uh, black has a really comfortable position with pressure against the e-pawn. Instead though, bishop f6 gives white a little bit extra central space, and queen d4 probably wasn't the best way to make use of it. Once again, probably just sitting on this space or playing one of these natural moves was a better way of playing for uh, for white here. Um, but in the end, Sam finds uh, finds the draw in endgame and manages to draw it. I think the reason he got into this worst endgame was really because of this move bishop f6 
So uh, my claim is A5, total equality here for black. Nothing to worry about. OK, let's move on. For queen e1 line, how do we push for more than equality with black? Well, you don't really often push for more than equality with black out of the opening. Um, I say equality, I don't mean that that's the end of the game. Um, there's definitely a lot of chess left to be played in all of these lines, but uh, you, you can't really push for more than equality with, with the black pieces out of the opening. You just want an equal position with some imbalances uh, uh, with, with things to play for. In this case, it was that target on e4. But let's go ahead and move on. Uh, now I want to take a look at, for our main variation, a game between Epson Lee and Oystein Hole. Uh, maybe Hole, I don't know how to say these names. I only speak English, I apologize. Uh, and the point of this line, these two players aren't quite as strong as the players in the previous game. I just wanted to show off a, a few move order tricks from white that you're going to have to be aware of and ways you can kind of respond to them. So e4, c6, d4, d5, f3. We get into our main variation here, knight f3, bishop g4, bishop c4, knight d7. And then instead of the main move in this game, white tried this move c3. So who sees white's threat here? Who sees white's threat? What if we simply play our normal move, knight g f6? What is white going to play now? What does white play now? Uh, Jeremiah Parker, I think it's just YouTube. Uh, YouTube has an auto captioning system, I think. Uh, so yeah, Ite Sitbon has the answer. It is queen b3. This is the threat that white made with c3 before castles. Now, you're going to face pressure on both f7 and b7. And it's actually quite awkward for black to deal with. And uh, I think white would have a substantial advantage if the game continued in this manner. So perhaps c3 is a slightly more accurate move order for uh, white. The good news is for black is that we can solve these problems with useful moves. There's really two main options here that I'm going to recommend. One option is to play the move b5. Uh, kicking this bishop away, of course, negates this threat immediately. Uh, the option I'm going to recommend, though, is simply bishop h5. Uh, and you've already seen why this is a useful move. In the main variations where this wh white queen comes out to h4, we often reroute this bishop back to g6 anyways. And so from h5, we guard this f7 square. Now the move queen b3 is, is quite simply just a little bit pointless now uh, from white. The move b5 could come. The move queen c7 could come. Uh, black can really play anything here. And uh, life is going to be fine, just as long as you don't hang your b7 pawn. Um, in this case, it is worth not hanging. I do want to mention... Uh, you guys might have a question. This is the first game that we looked at, so why can't white play queen b3 here? The answer is white definitely can, but black will simply castle. And now uh, this is one of those cases where the b7 pawn is a little bit more trouble than it's worth. Uh, the engine actually gives it as uh, over minus one here for black. Uh, it's just simply going to be bad for white to spend so much time to take this pawn. Uh, just as an example line, rook b8, queen a6, e takes d4, c takes d4, um, and already you can consider capturing your pawn back here on e4. Uh, I think this line is a bit better, though, taking off this piece first. Now, for example, if uh, queen takes c6, knight df6 will come, and the black pieces are, are kind of totally dominating in the center. Uh, it's true that white has one extra pawn for the moment, but uh, all of the white pieces are, are really going to be misplaced. Moves like rook c8 are coming, and black is, is doing actually fantastic here. So that's why in the main variation, we're not as worried about queen b3, because we simply respond to it with castles, and then the b7 pawn isn't so important. But with c3 first, we don't quite have the time to solve our problems so comfortably, so that's when this move bishop h5 kind of comes in. Now castles from white, knight gf6, bishop d g5, bishop d6, knight bd2, castles, queen e1, queen c7. This is stuff we've all really seen before. d takes e5, uh, okay. And so then this is the point of the second game as well. In the previous games, 
we or the one previous game we saw queen h4 here when bishop g6 was played uh, and with these moves inserted uh, white black already had some nice pressure on the e4 pawn so a natural question to ask is what if uh, white captures on e5 first now in those other lens that I was showing uh, it was pretty common for me to play the move knight takes f knight takes e5 keeping this bishop here on d6 and allowing bishop takes f6 and g takes f6 and you can play like this here but I don't think it's quite as good as when the queen is already committed to h4 note that some natural moves there for white even include the move uh, queen g3 in some cases uh, getting this queen off of h4, so knight h4 to f5 doesn't come as fast. Now, of course, the h4 square is clear, so these moves like knight h4 are a little bit quicker for white. So I'm going to recommend the move bishop takes e5 instead, as was played in this game. So if white uh, isn't putting uh, a super ton of pressure on f6 uh, already and takes on e5 a little bit early, Generally, the move I'm recommending is bishop takes e5, and that's, that's going to be the case uh, specifically here as well. So knight takes e5, played in the game, queen takes e5. Of course, we're not really interested in allowing bishop takes f6 stuff here, so queen takes e5. In this game, the move rook f5 came on the board to kick this queen away. Queen simply drops back to c7. Note that the move e5 here would actually just be a little bit uh, premature. Moves like rook f e8 come on the board, and it's pretty difficult now for white to keep a hold of this uh, e5 pawn. For example, queen h4 unpins, but uh, now rook takes e5 is, is going to be perfectly fine for, uh, for black. So instead of e5, queen h4 was played in the game first, uh, avoiding some of those lines, but now the move uh, bishop g6 was played in the game. Uh, bishop g6, though, is actually a little bit of an inaccuracy here. Let's see if you guys can take what you learned from the Sam Shankland game, uh, some moves that white played that were perhaps necessary, and find the advantage for black in this position. Black can actually just get a pretty significant advantage here. So we play for draw with the Karo. Not the case, Ashim. Uh, we actually play chess with the Karo. Um, generally, the way uh, openings work, as some other people are saying in the chat, is you don't play for a draw, you play for equality with black. This is the point of the opening phase of the game. There are more phases to the game than the opening. So you play to equalize with black, and then after you've equalized, then you're on level footing with your opponent to play chess, and that's where you can try to outplay them to play for the win. Now, some lines in every opening are going to be more imbalanced than others. Some lines are going to look more drawish than others, but uh, it's just down, down to the game, down to the game of chess. So yeah, everybody in the chat seems to have it now. Due to the fact that white has left this king on g1, the move queen b6 would have been quite nice here for black picking up uh, the b2 pawn in some order. Instead, though, bishop g6, and now white plays this move rook f2, trying to dodge perhaps that exact threat. This is still a pretty nice position, though, for black. We just have comfortable pressure on this e4 pawn. Uh, and this is why white usually doesn't take on e5 quite so early. Uh, basically, my understanding of the position is if white takes on e5 and opens up this e file, and ends up with the pawn being stuck on e4, it's going to be a pretty good position for black. However, if white does manage to push this pawn to e5, then it is quite sensible for white to take on e5, uh, because with these open lines, with this extra space, with threats of e6, white does have plenty to play for now, using this e pawn as more of an advantage than a liability. On e4, I'm kind of claiming this e pawn is just strictly a liability for white. So because of that, black is a nice position. We see knight e5 in this game uh, was an interesting try, uh, perhaps not totally required. Uh, I prefer the classic plan of just expanding over here on the queen side, not really giving white the counterplay with bishop takes f6, and this would be uh, perfectly fine for black. Instead though, knight e5 uh, goes for some more imbalances. We see takes and takes. Uh, once again, uh, taking on uh, f6 isn't really advisable. If you take with the queen, there's a fork, and if you take with the rook, uh, well now queen b6 check comes on the board again. Uh, and perhaps not even, 
uh, takes on a on b2 immediately. But the queen's just in good position, and there's threats to uh, to the white pieces. So instead, bishop e2 saves this bishop from the threat of capture. Now rook d8 threatens this knight. Knight back to f3. We see knight takes f3, bishop takes f3, queen e5. And once again, the, the game is now really in, in black's hands here. Black is just applying pressure to this e4 pawn, and white is kind of in a more reactive uh, kind of state. Not really creating white's own threats, rather responding to black's threats and, and just having to defend this e4 pawn. So rook e2, rook d3 played in the game. And I'll quickly show you the rest of the game. It really does just revolve around this e4 pawn. We see king g7, queen d6, c5, black expands a little bit over here, keeps an eye on his weakness, uh, and after h5, uh, we have loaded our Alakine's gun on e4. g4 was required to stop f5, and now we see h4, and finally black expands over here on the queen side, creating more threats. Uh, e4 gets traded for h4, and at the end of the day, uh, black just had a very nice endgame up a pawn, and did manage to win did manage to win eventually. Uh, White went ahead and resigned here. So the point of this game that I wanted to get across is this early c3. You do have to be on the lookout for this early c3. I recommend this move bishop h5. b5 is also a perfectly fine way of playing in response to this. Um, and beyond that, uh, I wanted to show what happens when White takes on e5 a little bit earlier than we saw in the Sam Shankland game. And the reason uh, you don't often see this is because this e4 pawn does end up being a bit of a liability, as I said. Now, I wanted to take a look at one more interesting kind of line here uh, in this last game between uh, Gil Popilski and Hikaru Nakamura. Nakamura, perhaps a player you've heard of before. Now, uh, in this game, we're going to see White actually adopt a slightly different setup to what we saw uh, earlier. And... You know, I spent a, a normal amount of time preparing the lecture for, for these first two games. You know, I already had a pretty good feeling of those structures, and I was just getting some specifics down. Uh, but then this line kind of surprised me with how crucial it actually, or how critical it actually is. White does create some pretty nasty threats for black to deal with, so I definitely think it's worth covering. And if you play against the caro with the white pieces often, uh, and are looking for a line, perhaps you could consider this one in the fantasy variation, because... Uh, it's one that I wasn't super familiar with, and it's it's one that does seem to actually be perfectly playable for white, and does cause black some problems. So let's take a look at it with these remaining few minutes. d4, d5, f3 takes takes, e5, knight f3, bishop g4, we do see c3 now for white, a slightly different move order from what we looked at. We don't have to play bishop h5 yet, because bishop c4 isn't on the board, so white isn't threatening to fork these pawns just yet, so knight d7 comes on the board. Now if queen b3, like I said, this isn't actually a fork, so we can just kind of defend our pawn any way we like. Instead, now we're going to see white adopt uh, a different setup, as I said. In all the previous games, we were looking at bishop c4. Now I want to take a look at bishop d3. Uh, and this is a very actually combative way for white to play this opening. It looks simply less active than bishop c4, but what white is saying with this move bishop d3 is that he will open this diagonal, and so he will just leave this bishop on d3, where it's going to be more active once the diagonal opens. So uh, this is where it becomes all the more critical to keep a hold of our strong point on e5. Uh, if this strong point falls, then white's going to open up this diagonal, and black could get into some trouble. So this is why I think this line is more combative, actually, than bishop c4. So bishop d6 was Hikaru Nakamura's response, perfectly fine. Castles, knight gf6, all the same moves that we've seen from black so far. And now white plays this slightly weird-looking move, a4. And the purpose behind this move is, is really simply to prevent the move b5. Now, why does white want to prevent the move b5? You know, his bishop's sitting perfectly fine on d3. In fact, it makes more sense to prevent b5 with the bishop on c4 to avoid losing this tempo. Uh, in this case, though, with the bishop on d3, there's one more advantage for white, and it's that it's preventing the natural setup of the black pieces with the queen on c7 and the bishop on d6. How is it preventing this? Well, with the c4 open, 
white actually is aiming to land a different piece on this square. And that, of course, is this knight on b1. So a4 was played to keep hold of this b5 square to keep these knight c4 threats alive for white. Now black castles. We see knight bd2 uh, come on the board for white. Hikaru plays rook e8, a perfectly natural move, defending the strong point on e5, making threats to e4. And now knight c4 comes on the board. Uh, Hikaru simply responds with bishop c7, which is a, a totally fine move here. Uh, the problem now for uh, black, of course, is that the queen cannot really come to this natural square. Queen c2 was white's move in the game, and uh, if you analyze this game, uh, as I did with an engine, you're going to get some pretty funny looking stuff for a little bit where the engine thinks that uh, black is actually uh, able to sacrifice a piece on the e4 square. But after analyzing those lines a little bit more in depth, it, it turns out just to be bad for black. So, so don't be fooled by that. The line that Stockfish gives is something like bishop f3, rook f3, takes, takes, takes on e4, bishop takes e4, and then the move knight f6. And for a second, it thinks that black is doing quite well here with queen takes d4, rook e1 coming. But at the end of the day, white's just up a piece, and white is just better. So don't fault for those tricks. In the game now, uh, Hikaru actually plays the move e takes d4, uh, giving up on this e5 pawn and eventually uh, just allowing, in fact, the move e5 to come on the board. Now, uh, I don't really like this way of playing from Hikaru Nakamura. Uh, in fact, in the game, he did end up a bit worse, which is really surprising to me because his name is Hikaru Nakamura and his opponent's name I can't pronounce and, and you know, I'm and less familiar with. You know, generally, Hikaru Nakamura is better out of the opening against these players. So uh, I found that really interesting, and that's why I think this line is pretty critical to look at. The line I'm going to recommend, uh, after I analyzed for a lot longer than I care to admit, <laughs> uh, is bishop takes f3. I think this line uh, gives black the, the best position here. You give up this light squared bishop, but in return, you loosen white's hold of the e5 squared. This is kind of the principle behind it, and the specifics work out, I think, to be pretty OK for black. So. Uh, for example, rook takes f3, g takes f3 doesn't make a lot of sense for white, so rook takes f3. And then the move I'm going to recommend is the move knight f8, uh, simply unveiling this threat on the d4 pawn and getting into some fun kind of tactics. Uh, for example, if, the, if white wants to play a little bit more simply, a move like king h1 can come on the board. And then uh, there are a variety of ways of playing here for uh, Black, for example, we can try and take this pawn off the board. This is perfectly playable. If, so sorry, I should say the simple way of playing bishop e3. But then you run into the nice move knight g4 by black, and white is going to have all the same problems anyways. So it's really actually quite difficult for white to defend this pawn. Queen f2, likely going to meet the same fate of knight g4 here. So instead, white is now forced to go for this active try because these boring moves don't work because d4 hangs. So white goes for the active move, bishop g5. And the line I came up with here is e takes d4. And rather than the move c takes d4 by white, allowing queen takes d4 with check, the move e5 by white is, is going to be a pretty interesting one. Uh, and the line could continue, bishop takes e5, knight takes e5, rook takes e5, bishop takes f6, g takes f6, uh, rook a to f1. And what we have now is uh, a really fun type of position where white has a lot of pressure on the king side, but in the meantime, the white center has blown up, and black is actually up two pawns for the moment, two pawns. d takes c3, for example, kind of secures this advantage. Queen takes c3, and now we, we really are in for a, a very fun game here, where black is up these two pawns, and white has this nice bishop, some active pieces, and some threats around the king. Uh, now, I haven't analyzed this uh, to, to super, super deep levels, where I, I'm going through all the various options from this point forward. Um, but if, if you do run the engine for a while, as I did, uh, it, it thinks uh, equality, <laughs> um, which is really the, the funny answer that, that the engine often gives in positions like this. So some kind of dynamic equality here for black from what I can tell. Uh, 
as far as moves, uh, for example, uh, even a move like king g7 is playable. Now if rook takes f6, we're simply going to take this back and go in for this type of endgame position where we have two rooks against the queen. Uh, and if white wants to keep pieces on the board, for example, h4, uh, well, black is just going to start organizing the rooks on these open central files. And uh, black should be perfectly fine in the game. And now from what I can tell, white is actually the one who's going to end up worse unless white immediately goes in for these moves like rook takes f6. Going in for this uh, two rooks versus queen endgame where black does have an extra pawn. Uh, white probably should be able to, to be fine in those positions as well due to the unfortunate uh, safety of the black king. But of course, black is, is not really going to be in, in too much danger there. So that's what I'm recommending in response to this line. Knight c4, bishop c7, Queen c2, I like this nice move, knight f8, to keep up the pressure on white's or, Well, sorry, bishop takes f3 is required first to, to alleviate pressure on e5, and then knight f8 with, these pressure, with this pressure on white's center. Now, in the game, Hikaru Nakamura played the move e takes d4, c takes d4, bishop takes f3, rook takes f3, uh, and I, I just don't think it makes sense to allow white to push in the center quite so early on with, this, with these e5 breaks. I think this is just going to uh, ask for a little bit of trouble here. In the game, Hikaru continued with knight b6, and white does immediately play this nice move e5. And this is really giving white uh, everything he wanted here with this pressure uh, along this open diagonal. So that's why I recommend this other line for black. Knight takes c4 played in the game, queen takes c4, b5, queen c3, bishop b6, bishop e3, knight into d5, and this is uh, Hikaru's compensation for allowing the move e5, he gets this nice d5 square for his knight. Queen b3 was played in the game. b takes a4 from Hikaru. Rook takes a4. Rook b8 now makes a threat. Queen c4. Queen d7 from Hikaru. Uh, bishop f2. And g6 now from Hikaru. And this is where uh, I think uh, white's advantage started to dwindle a little bit because white was playing Hikaru Nakamura and Hikaru so far has been playing more or less perfectly. Um, <laughs> uh, I think the move h4 would have actually given white uh, a nicer edge here. The point being, if you don't play h5, white will play h5 himself and start to weaken down uh, these king's side pawns in front of the black king, start to get uh, a little bit more pressure over here. Uh, and if you do play h5, well, h5 itself is, in fact, a, a concession, with this g6 pawn becoming a lot more weak after this. Moves like queen c2 to follow, uh, sorry, not queen c3, queen c2 to follow, with threats of bishop takes g6 uh, always going to be in the air, and things like this would have been really nice for white. Instead, though, bishop e4 is a fine move, but f5 by Hikaru is trying to uh, force some pieces off the board. Bishop c2, king g7. Rook fa3, now a5 by Hikaru is locking things down on this queen side. And now after especially a move like king h1, uh, black has enough time to get back into this game comfortably. Bishop c7, queen a2, knight b4, uh, queen c4, knight d5, queen a2, and they repeated moves with a draw. Um, so this is the last line I wanted to look at here. Uh, with all of these threats coming on the board for white. So, of course, this is the line with bishop d3, actually a more combative line by white, claiming he will be able to play this move e5 at a later date. Of course, what I'm recommending in response is don't let white do that. Uh, defend your strong point on e5. Take on f3 if you have to, to defend your strong point on e5. And from there, due to the way white has played, it becomes quite awkward to defend this pawn on d4. And because of that, you get some nice threats with a move like knight f8 in this kind of position. Um, OK, that, I believe, is it for me today. I will allow the YouTube chat to uh, ask one or two more questions, if they have any of it, before we get going here. Um, if uh, there are no questions, if you're watching live, be sure to tune in to the Twitch channel directly after this, where I will be teaching tactics time. Uh, if you're watching the recorded video, thank you very much for joining uh, me. That's all for tonight. It's looking like there aren't really any questions for me in the chat. Hopefully you enjoyed this lecture on the fantasy variation of the Karakhan. Hopefully you feel confident enough to play it in some of your own games. 
Um, just be sure to avoid these few tricky moves by white, and then black should be doing quite well. Uh, that's all for me this week. Thank you so much for joining me this week on Chess Openings Explained. My name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.